So I'll go ahead and start. Um, I want to welcome you to our broader impacts lightning presentation session. And we have five wonderful presenters um, who are here to share their work with you. So to start off, uh, we have David Bashweiner, and he is an associate professor of music theory. David, take it away. Today, I'm gonna ask you a question and hopefully answer it for you. Why use neuroscience to study music? I'm sorry, one second. So why does music exist? Um, does it have any real value or is it just a guilty pleasure? According to Steven Pinker, music is nothing more than auditory cheesecake. Pinker writes, as far as biological cause and effect are concerned, music is useless. It shows no signs of design for attaining a goal such as long life, grandchildren, or accurate perception and prediction of the world. Music appears to be a pure pleasure technology, a cocktail of recreational drugs that we ingest through the ear to stimulate a mass of pleasure circuits at once. And Pinker goes on to explain that he calls music auditory cheesecake, since cheesecake is a brew of mega doses of agreeable stimuli, which we concocted for the express purpose of pressing our pleasure buttons. Pornography is another pleasure technology, and the arts are a third. Now, if Pinker is right, if music really is mere auditory cheesecake, just a hedonic auditory stimulation, then studying it neuroscientifically, I think we would agree, would be rather wasteful. And here is a now classic study by Bennett et al, which put a dead fish in the scanner and still found statistical, statistically significant results uh, when it was showed images <laughs> of humans in various, doing various tasks. So, but what if Pinker is wrong? What if music is not a mere sensory pleasure? What if studying music can reveal to us aspects of the mind that we cannot discover by other means? In collaboration with Dr. Rex Young, who you see in the upper right there, I conducted a pair of studies examining structure and functional connectivity in the brains of creative musicians and we did arrive at one such counterintuitive finding. This also happened uh, through a series of extensive literature reviews that I did with my former student, Donna Bacon, also an excellent violinist. And this counterintuitive finding was that music is not simply an art of sound for sound's sake, as we might have expected. When you look at the brains of creative musicians um, compared to other musicians or to non-musicians, you don't actually see marked differences in the auditory regions of the temporal lobe, which you see there in yellow. Instead, what you see is that the brains of creative musicians differ mostly in the motor planning regions of the frontal lobe. This just really made us think, what is music? What is musical creativity? So I have a picture of John Coltrane here. And um, a, a conclusion that neuroscience led us to come up with is that auditory sequences are not really just auditory. When musicians compose or improvise, they primarily envision, it seems, not patterns of sound, but rather the motor patterns that produce those sounds. And it turns out that auditory cortex on its own can't really sustain representations uh, longer than a few hundred milliseconds. So the length of a few syllables or short words. To string together multiple musical events in larger groups, a musician recruits the same apparatus, apparatus that is used to string words together into sentences. And this happens to be found in the motor planning regions of frontal cortex. This leads to 
the counterintuitive conclusion that music is actually better understood as an art of movement for sound's sake, which really does make us think, rethink some basic assumptions about music. In uh, the research group that I'm part of, we have uh, two. Um, we have a, a neurosurgeon, Dr. Muhammad Chohan, and together with Dr. Rex Young, they perform awake craniotomy procedures. So what this means is when someone goes in with a tumor that's usually on the left side in the temporal lobe or frontal lobe, the doctors will wake the patient up um, when the brain has been exposed. And they do some cognitive tests to make sure that the parts of the brain that they're hoping to remove are not going to cause in, uh, extreme damage in the linguistic faculty. So this is sometimes practiced with musicians. As you can see, these are pictures from all around the world of musicians who have needed brain surgery. And they, doctors pretty much ad hoc try to adapt this procedure for music. But of course, all those instruments are very different. And so far as I know, this has always happened in a completely different part of the world. Um, so there aren't formalized procedures. So our team designed a plan, which we proposed to the NIH. We didn't get the grant the first time, but we hope to. Uh, in a later time. Um, the plan was first to do a series of investigations of best practices of which specific music cognitive tests you would want to employ during surgery based on which part of the brain was going to be excised. And then we also wanted to create a common forum for surgeons performing these rare procedures across the world to communicate with one another and then learn from past successes and failures. In conclusion, I turn around the question that we began with, which was why use neuroscience to study music. And I would just like to reflect on why you might wanna use neuro music to study neuroscience. Music, as we know, is mysterious. As Steven Pinker points out, there's no clearly good reason to like music. And there are really plenty of reasons to not like music. There you have a little picture of <laughs> a little devil person on the bed. Uh, it can be quite a waste of time and energy. And uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain. And yet from our very first days to our very last days of life, we, we spent significant time with music. So to the extent that these statements are true, that there's no good reason to like it, we probably actually just don't have a great grasp on what music really is. Neuroscience suggests new ways of identifying how music differs from more basic hedonistic pleasures, such as eating dessert. And I gave you some examples of that. And then in turn, what we learn about music, I think allows us, A, not just to appreciate our cherished art form, um, and also not just to help out those requiring surgery and in danger of losing their musical capacity. But I think in addition, music aspire, inspires neuroscience to rise and meet the challenge of accounting for that still great mystery that it is, that is music. Oh, that was great. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, we'll open it up to questions. We have about five minutes for questions. You know, David, I, I was sort of taken aback that if your whole pre stance that like music is, you know, why do it kind of thing. I mean, I, it just seems so pervasive among all cultures in some way, shape and form. Um, and to me, you know, for myself, I can say I can remember anything that's in a song. I mean, the connection to memory uh, you know, my mother suffered from Alzheimer's and I, you know, she loved so many different things. I could just, if I just hummed the beginning of something, she would just go on singing the rest of it. It was just ingrained in her brain. So I, I think it's, maybe it's like, why talk? Maybe we should all be doing opera. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's very, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really, really good point. Um, I mean, I, you know, one way that you could say it is 
it's very difficult to get a grant for studying music, but if you can justify it by some other means, then it works. And, and music really does overlap with basically every faculty we have. So all of our social relationships, language, mathematics, um, emotions, memory, how memory works, right? Um, how attention works. Uh, it's difficult to find something that music does not significantly overlap with. Um, and so, yeah, you, you know, I, the reason I present it that way is it, it, there is a biological mystery to it. I mean, it's like, we do think, we do think of music as being a luxury. I mean, it happens in the school system too, right? The school yeah, system. No, I, I that, totally yeah. appreciate that angle okay. and that you're being in a way a little bit facetious kind of in that, in that. Approach. Yeah, I yeah. think I use, I use Pinker as, as <laughs> rhetorically, right? As yeah. a kind of straw man. I don't have to create an imaginary straw man. I can use him. Right. And, and then people say, oh yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> Where, yeah. I think this is really interesting work that you're doing. And um, I thought immediately when you were talking about um, how the brains of musicians differ from um, other people's brains is that it has a more planning function and that's that frontal lobe planning. And, you know, we have the scourge of ADHD, which is an executive function, uh, executive function planning um, frontal lobe issue. And I, um, I wonder if you know of any research done about um, the connection between uh, learning music. I've learned, I, I've heard about learning, you know, chess helps you with math or learning music mm -hmm. helps you with math. But what about, have you heard of anything being done about examining um, the inclusion of music into sort of um, maybe sort of executive function or dysfunction, um, you know, uh, diagnoses and, and how that might affect it? Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, it's funny because like early, in one of the studies, we had some some preliminary results that looked like they were going to be all about executive function. <laughs> so I spent like a year uh, trying to make sense of that, and then it turns out that once we got the full results, that didn't have anything to do with it. But um, so it, it, yeah, there is lots of stuff about that. Like the whole the whole notion of transfer effects is is super important. So you, we made this when we we got an NEA grant at some point, National Endowment for the Arts, and um, when we did, the argument we made is that um, in school systems, No Child Left Behind and other programs, Race to the Top, other programs like that, keep trying to reduce the amount of time spent with arts and increase the amount of time spent with reading and math because those were like the standardized tests. And the argument we were making is, do we actually know that giving someone less musical experience is going to raise math and reading. And so we presented all the evidence that we know of uh, showing transfer effects that, that if you just spend more time doing reading or more time doing math, that isn't necessarily better than spending time doing music, which can be, you know. So uh, the transfer effects from music to all those other faculties, math, language, um, reading, emotional regulation, social relationships, they're really profound. I mean, it's difficult to say 100%. Yeah, you, you don't, you wouldn't want to be, yeah, I, yes. I mean, basically, yes, it's all there. It's a huge topic, but it, it is, that's a real thing, definitely. All right, we have more questions, but um, I think we've run out of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next presentation. Um, up next, we have Sarita Cargis, who's an associate professor in the Honors College, and her co-presenter is Olivia torres Hohola, who is a program coordinator for Lobo Respect, and they will be presenting about improving the basic needs security of New Mexico University students. Sarita, you're muted. Sorry about that.
Okay. Um, Olivia and I are going to share our thoughts on the broader impacts of the basic needs research project at UNM. I'll start off with a very brief introduction to the project and then we'll share the potential broader impacts. First, the research. Our study is assessing the prevalence of basic needs and security, that is food and housing and security at UNM. We have two teams, several of the members who are here with us today. Uh, one group wanted to focus on research design and data collection, and the other consists of those who wanted to focus on researching solutions. We all have the goal of implementing changes for the students at UNM based on data. While not part of the basic needs research team, there is a provost level steering committee for attending to basic needs and security guided by Pamela Cheek and consisting of the solutions team and the women who run Lobo Respect, Dean Nasha Torres, Lisa Lindquist, and Olivia. Last April, we began our longitudinal study and emailed 12,000 students using a stratified random sampling method. We included undergrads, grads, professional students, as well as international students. This week, we began round two of data collection as our survey will be sent out for the second year. For the sake of time, I'm going to just focus on food insecurity, though housing insecurity uh, prevalence followed similar patterns. The USDA survey we used has four levels of food security, and they put low and very low food security together to indicate the extent of insecurity. Almost 32% of our students are food insecure, with 17% of them being very food insecure, which includes skipping meals and going hungry. Extrapolating from our sample suggests that as many as 6,000 UNM students are food insecure and 3,000 very food insecure. As you can see, this problem affects all levels of students at UNM. Consistent with other studies, undergraduates suffer it more than graduate students, but it affects all groups. However, it hits certain populations much harder than others. Our American Indian students have the highest prevalence, followed by African American, international, and then Hispanic students. Not shown here is the prevalence among gay and lesbian students, which is about 45%. Pursuing a degree increases the chances of being food insecure for reasons beyond a student's control. This is national data. Nationally, the cost of attendance and student fees have risen dramatically, while aid has simply not kept pace. Uh, more financial aid goes in the form of merit awards nationally than, uh, in, than being need-based. And as the fourth bullet point points out, a majority of students live below the poverty line and many do not have family support. As far as broader impacts, our goal is to help students become more food, insecure, more food secure, first at UNM and then statewide. We are also contributing data to the national conversation because there is no nationally connect, collected data uh, by the USDA as there is for food insecurity at the household level. In order for us to have a broader impact, multiple levels of change are required. We need more awareness at the legislative level um, to get funds to support students' basic needs. And we have gotten some recognition by some legislators. We need more awareness raised at all levels at UNM partially in order to, to destigmatize the use of services, which is something we found was a problem among our, our students. They're embarrassed um, about, about being poor. Um, and we need to redirect resources to support uh, more basic needs at UNM. And happily that is, has begun to happen at UNM and Olivia will take it from here and explain how it is happening at UNM. Hi everyone. So um, I'm a program coordinator over at the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center and the Food Pantry is my primary program. Um, we, I do wanna make the distinction of what we are currently doing and have been doing and just lay the groundwork for what happens already at the university and then how we're taking steps to improve our programs. So we do house two main programs, the first being the Campus Food Pantry, which we opened in fall 2019, whose information you can see on the slide here, and the Mobile Food Pantry, which has been in operation since 2014. Um, that mobile program operates as a once a month pop up in the south lot parking lot and it serves both students and community members. However, this program has been suspended since March 2020 due to crowd size limitations. But as we return to more in person activities as a county and state we're committed to resuming this program once we're able. As you can imagine a pantry that serves on average of 200 people each time takes many helping hands to coordinate. 
Both programs do utilize a partnership with Roadrunner Food Bank for food procurement, as well as relying on community donations. Since March 2020, the campus food pantry converted from students shopping in our actual pantry space inside the University Advisement and Enrichment Center to distributing pre-made bags and boxes of groceries in the parking lot just outside of our building. Since converting to this curbside service, the campus food pantry has served a thousand students and acquired over 16,000 pounds of food from Roadrunner Food Bank. Now I know you might be thinking that's a lot of food for only a thousand students, but we do have students utilize this service anywhere from once to several times per month. And this program has also utilized 65 different volunteers. And I know there's probably more in that list. And with many of these volunteers being actual fellow students. Next slide, please. So we are currently working to improve these offerings by utilizing Roadrunner Food Bank's ability to provide us with produce, which happens each time we place an order, which is usually on a bi-monthly basis. We began this offering back in October and it's been very well received by students. Additionally, after a presentation from Dr. Cargus, um, ASUNM approached us for the possibility of moving the food pantry to the sub. This measure was actually approved by the sub board and we can't thank them enough for the opportunity to reach more students. This will probably go into effect in fall 2021 as we sort of move back more into in-person um, activities. Additionally, our Dean of Students, Nasha Torres, is working with the UNM Foundation in order to endow the food pantry account. So that means that folks can monetarily donate and has created a payroll deduction letting faculty and staff assign a donation amount directly from their paycheck to our program. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Lastly, um, my supervisor, Lisa Lindquist, Dr. Cargas, and myself um, all collaborated with Megan Jacobs' course within the Honors College, which is the Fine Art as Global Perspective, Social Transformation Through Art. So within this course, students were tasked to develop marketing materials for the food pantry, which we all reviewed and provided feedback on. There's a couple examples that you can see here. These materials made by students for students increases awareness and access on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So we're so excited to be using these marketing materials going forward. We are just thrilled to see these changes and are hopeful that this program um, can endure into the future with support of faculty, staff, the Basic Needs Steering Committee, the Dean of Students Office and the university at large. At the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center, we're here to serve students and it's been my pleasure to work with students both volunteering and accessing our pantry to spread the word and destigmatize usage of this resource. Asking for help can be difficult, but seeing fellow students participating in this resource is a powerful tool for destigmatization and I feel honored to be part of that process. On behalf of Lobo Respect, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Sarita and Olivia. Um, I think we have time for one question, unfortunately. <laughs> that was a lot of info. <laughs> that was great. I love the work that you guys do. And it's always so wonderful to see you all set up and usually in the South parking lot, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. Olivia, can you talk a little bit more about the subspace for the pantry and uh, what benefits it will provide over your current space? Sure. So um, part of our work on destigmatizing the pantry is putting it in a more accessible, um, very open location. So um, this actual space is downstairs. Um, just across from the computer lab where I'm sure some of you might be familiar, the barber shop used to be there. Um, so that space um, has been open to us. We are currently going to uh, still keep our space that we currently have. That way we can just have multiple um, sites for folks. And, and additionally, the sub will provide us with having a more um, sustainable, regular day-to-day -day presence um, because at, at current operations, we're only um, 
able to do like one day a week. So being in the sub, I think it'll give us a little bit more um, leniency and flexibility for hours. All right. So next we have Laura Crossy, who's a professor in Earth and Planetary Sciences. And her presentation is titled Integrating Teaching, Research, and Outreach. It's about time. Great, thank you, Irene, and everyone for putting this together. It's so fascinating. I, I'm from a STEM program, but I'm going to talk about a broader impact within a national park. It happens to be a Grand Canyon National Park. Um, in terms of partners to, to do this, this thing, it, it was a lot of partners, but some of the things I want to focus on are uh, people that you wouldn't think of. Like uh, I'll mention that, you know, this was like a two and a half million dollar grant to build an exhibit at a national park where the bureaucracy was just unbelievable. And it involved things in purchasing that as a UNM uh, geology professor, I didn't have a lot of experience with. We, we closed this grant on time within uh, pennies of the full amount. We ha had subcontracted to architects. If we didn't have very good communication uh, with the business office, with uh, with all of our uh, contract and grant people, we, you know, I can't even imagine what kind of a disaster would have happened. So, you know, don't forget uh, all the wonderful staff people behind different activities that happen uh, at UNM. Uh, other partners, of course, were the park itself. Uh, some of the concessioners who work at Grand Canyon National Park. We had a panel, uh, including Ramona Sacastewa, who I'll mention uh, in a minute what she brought to the, the linear thinkers of making a linear timeline uh, as a science exhibit. And she forced us to have round markers because we were just so darn linear and she wanted us to remind people about time being a cycle as well. So uh, uh, Carl is my, my uh, husband and also research collaborator. So he's been an integral part of this project. Um, the other aspect of it is how, as a faculty member, do you do kind of significant outreach activities if, if it's not dovetailing with your teaching and training, your mentoring of your own students, both undergraduate and graduate. We brought classes over when we helped uh, uh, get this uh, thing underway. Um, and then, of course, our own research efforts at Grand Canyon. And it's by integrating those things that we're able to sort of put in more time than otherwise would be possible. If you're not familiar with the Trail of Time, it's at Grand Canyon Village. It's on sort of prime turf between the Avapai Geology Museum and the old Grand Canyon Village. This is a historic stretch. So the trail itself um, uh, has a little um, zone where it's like an on-ramp that teaches you uh, what a million years is, all the things that could happen in a million years. It starts with the steps, one meter is a year goes to a decade, goes to a century, goes to a thousand years, goes to 10,000 years, goes to 100,000 years. And within each of those, it's kind of reminding you the sorts of things that happen from personal and familial uh, to ancestors, to climate change, to glaciers coming and going, to species going extinct. All of those things all happen in 1 million years. And yet 1 million years is the basic unit of time when you consider the full spectrum of geologic time. This is called visceral learning by actually walking the distance. Many, many times the park said, can't you just make it hundred meters long? And we said, no, geologic time is big. The park is big. This is the world's best geologic landscape. And also it puts breadcrumbs out in front of people so they will actually see more of the park because people are terrified walking a distance along the rim where they don't know how far it is to the bathroom or anything. And this thing literally has bronze breadcrumbs every single meter so you know exactly how far and that you're not going to get off the trail. Uh, so then it goes on to the um, to the main trail of time where you walk back. The blue line is kind of tracing uh, as you walk uh, through time from the present to the past and then you end up at uh, visitor center over here. That only takes you back to the oldest rock in Grand Canyon uh, because this part of North America is only that old. It's about two kilometers, uh, just under two billion years old. Um, and so, so we continued the trail out. Uh, this was the historic section, so we couldn't really do it through the village, but we counted it out and then we picked up with the yellow part of the trail for people that want a longer walk. And it just turns out that Maricopa Point is just exactly the right 
a distance for the age of the earth. And because of the embayment here at the Grand Canyon Village, when you're standing over here at the beginning, you can literally look across and go, wow, that is how old the earth is at this pace of one step is a million years. Um, we, we did get a very significant informal science education grant that meant collaborating with educators, with assessors, uh, to be sure that people were learning the main concepts. It was an incredibly valuable experience uh, as a scientist to participate in those types of activities. So we had over $2 million to put this exhibit in place. And it started with just sort of a dream and a cartoon presented to the park, believe it or not, in 1995, after going to the rim and hearing the rangers talk about the seven ecosystems. And no offense to biology, but this is a geology park. Uh, and yet most of the park staff are biologists, uh, and they tend to focus on things they're comfortable with. So we wanted to make it a self-guided exhibit that would really help immerse people in what we think is the main feature of Grand Canyon National Park. It took us between 1995 and the early 2000s to actually get on the, the money train, so to speak, to develop the significant funding. Uh, and so that took a long time and that once we had the funding, it was only about four years till the exhibit actually opened. And the year afterward, it was voted best wayside exhibit in the nation by the National Interpreters Association. Needless to say, this is not what it looks like, but that was kind of the, the original vision. Um, we learned a lot about communication. The idea of a wayside exhibit in two kilometers, there's only 15 waysides. We had to pare ourselves down uh, to, to just limit ourselves to the main message. And we learned that having a conversational title would engage people of all different ages as they were walking along the trail. We didn't count on you know, having vast blocks of text. So it was to be thought provoking and to make it very conversational. And when we did the assessment, it was just shocking that when you watch groups go by, um, Within, within 10 yards of, of that wayside, somebody who didn't even seem to see it will say, did you know Grand Canyon is 6 million years old or whatever? And it'll either be, you know, Uncle Bob who reads every word of a wayside, but most often it was a middle school kid <laughs> that was noticing the exhibits. Um, we also used active words, touch, imagine, walk, Every wayside used active verbiage to engage people in the exhibit. It was a small thing, but it would make a person reach out their hand. We had the, I mentioned the, the, the big ideas, young canyon, old rock, it seems so obvious to a geologist and yet people don't quite get the difference between looking at a landscape and looking into the landscape at the stories that are revealed. Here in New Mexico, it's the same thing. The Sandia Mountain itself is a relatively young feature, but it exposes the ancient Sandia granite, which formed deep in the earth. So to get people to separate those stories uh, is really an important point of our exhibit. And then we did, uh, we went layer by layer and we found that the funny words are barriers. So we spelled out the words and we did prototyping, rapid prototyping. We put up cardboard exhibits. Uh, we, we saw people struggling with things. We, we quickly printed out a hand drawing of a modified thing and saw whether that seemed to work better. It was, it was pretty amazing how efficiently we managed to do this. And we still used C, find, find the fossils. Uh, and that kind of thing. We also realized, again, people are afraid. They don't know where they are. We devoted almost 30% of each of those waysides to the simple drawing where the person just moves along from here. They move along, they move along, they can see their progress. It gives them a comfort level, which then they're not distracted by when they're actually engaging with the exhibit. And we did the horizontal timeline connecting to a vertical stratigraphy. That was another a main concept is time is continuous, rock is not actually continuous, and it accumulates vertically. So these are big abstract concepts, but we think that the physical exhibit did a great job. The markers are actually really beautiful bronze. We, as I mentioned, Ramona Sacastewa, we had these as tick marks, believe it or not. Not only are tick marks much harder to install in asphalt, so this was much easier to drill round things, but she just said, no, no, no. You need it to be round because there is both a cyclicity to time and a linearity. And that's just an example of, of course, we included some information very early on about some of the 11 indigenous tribes that claim Grand Canyon as their home still today. And uh, the park literally this week is now becoming a world heritage site on the basis of cultural heritage. It already has been a heritage site on the basis of the natural a wonder that is Grand Canyon. So it's a very long trail, two kilometers long, 
one meter is a million years. And the real superstars of the exhibit are the rock. These are the rock stars. We brought up gorgeous examples, cut and polished in Berlin, New Mexico, uh, by the Rocky Mountain Travertine Company. Um, and we put them on here. We had to actually say, touch me. We, we first had the words, please touch on our prototypes. And people saw the word please, and they immediately were saying, don't touch the rock, don't touch the rock. They didn't even read the whole sentence. They saw please, and they said, don't touch it, because it's so natural to not be able to touch anything. So we made it a command, touch me. And these rocks are now, after 10 years, remarkably getting even more polished just from the many, many little hands that have touched them. Well, we had the fun of collecting them. There was a lot of work. We got them uh, on site in Grand Canyon. We collected them on raft trips, which naturally take you down through the entire stratigraphy of the canyon. We had a rock litter of steel. Uh, each rock was uh, on the order of uh, 600 pounds or so to be carried by six people in a not OSHA approved footwear. Please don't tell the UNM Health and Safety Office. We came down on a raft, rafting Grand Canyon's challenging enough, imagine with six tons, literally six tons of rock on a rubber life raft going through uh, these world-class rapids. We had partners of concessioners who donated the use of the rig and a boatman to help us with this collection. Uh, and also of course the park itself. We had, a one, we had a couple of days of a heavy lift helicopter. This is a very skinny little helicopter, room for the pilot only. And if you see down here, there's a daisy chain of four or five really big rocks that we could only lift out of the canyon. We couldn't get them down to the river. So we had these special ones lifted. Uh, we went ahead in a different helicopter. We'd wrap it up. We had a helicopter technician with us. And then by the fourth rock, the helicopter was coming down over our heads with three big steel baskets full of rocks. That was kind of nerve wracking. The park was a partner. It turned out that the park has so many demands and it spread so thin uh, that we ended up actually installing the uh, exhibit, mostly uh, the, the, the markers, which were very time consuming, but not that difficult. Uh, we installed them ourselves. So here's Carl and here's me driving the little Polaris along the trail. And so we literally installed all 2,500 uh, bronze markers along the trail on weekends and uh, holidays. Finally, it opened. Um, we did have other partners, Steve Semkin from Arizona State University, who focuses on indigenous knowledge that we were able to uh, build in some of the into the waysides and through the assessment. And Mike Williams, shown on the right, who's a UNM alum, by the way, but uh, is a, a professor now at uh, University of Massachusetts. Um, since that time, we've put together a little companion, a booklet for public use. Uh, it's sold by the Grand Canyon Conservancies and the, the proceeds are uh, to build up for trail maintenance uh, because there hasn't been a fund for that. And then now we're moving into social media and outreach. And so last year, because of COVID, uh, we took a, took a tip from the park who had a very successful, what they call star party. They're a dark sky park and they started doing that virtually. So we said, hey, what about geology? We did, we, we actually put this together in a very short time. We had two hours of programming for six or seven nights and we had over 145,000 minutes viewed on a Facebook premiere event. Uh, during the course of the week, I think we burned out all but the hardcore geologists here in, on social media, uh, but we, we really expanded their view. They have a, a set on the National Park, uh, the Grand Canyon uh, Facebook page. They have a pretty decent following that'll watch anything that gets put up there, uh, but we also brought in over 27% of new viewers uh, by focusing on this geology. This Friday, we're doing a live walk. It's uh, This is a National Park Week trails week and so we're going to do a virtual walk on the trail with one of the rangers live on facebook and we hope to have some visitors there well uh, i'll stop my sharing at this point it was kind of an unusual project to be involved with uh, it came at a great time for me again it was a while ago that this was installed but we're still uh, working very closely with the park to continue it uh, they're going to have to repave the trail that makes us very nervous but we've got to find a way to reclaim all that bronze and get it put back in a new trail. And um, thanks, I'm happy to take any questions about the exhibit. And if uh, if you haven't seen it, for heaven's sakes, take a grandmother, take a kid, uh, take a group out there to see it. It's really fun. Not to mention Grand Canyon is fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. We can probably take one question, unfortunately. Uh, 
Oh, Bo says, did you have to include the maintenance in your original plans? No, uh, for ongoing maintenance, that was not required by the National Science Foundation, but there was a letter uh, that was required from our par pound, uh, partner where they said once this is exhibit is in place, they will you know, take it under wing as they do with all exhibits. If you're familiar with the way things change in parks, though, you know that sometimes an exhibit gets old and then they do something different. We hope that this one sticks. Uh, you know, we see these statistics that people go to Grand Canyon and they spend, you know, like two minutes, the average visitor spends two minutes looking at the canyon and the rest of the hours they're spending in a, you know, in a little store in the park or something. And like I said about the breadcrumbs, this thing really makes it easy to uh, lead people out and along the trail and just get them engaged in that park resource. So it's all handicap accessible um, and multi-generational. And I'm Oh, I didn't even show you. The behind me is an example of the portals. These are giant portals built of those rocks that we, slabs that we uh, hauled out by helicopter. They're the real rock. I had the pleasure of uh, standing and walking along the trail uh, about two years ago, and there was a woman trying to explain Grand Canyon to her blind husband. And we just stopped and started chatting with him. She said, well, what, how would you describe it to him? I'm trying to explain what I'm seeing. And we were very close to this portal. And so I said, well, do you mind if I bring you over to this portal? And then we just put his hands on it. And the idea of those cold, deep basement rocks, the tilted layers, uh, the flat lying layers, you know, we never intended it to be that <laughs> as an example, but I, I was just surprised how all these elements built into the trail are really working for all sorts of people. That's wonderful. Okay, so next we have uh, Ted Nohola, who is a Distinguished and Regents Professor and the Director of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. His presentation is titled Place Knowing versus Place Making, the Role of Indigenous Planning and Design in Community. It's all Hi. yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Great, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and get my presentation going here. And it says my browser is preventing sharing screen. So um, do you know what's up with that? I should unmute, that might be helpful. Carla, can you um, give Ted access? Let's see if that works. Are you able to get in? Uh, no, it's still getting me the same thing. Uh, it says that you all can share. Did you come in through the Zoom app, Ted? Or did you come no, uh, I, I came in through the um, app. OK. I might have you here. You know what? Go ahead and send your slides to me and I'll try and share. And then Gigi, can we have you start? You want me to go right now? Would that be okay? And then that way yeah. it'll give me some time to send me his slides and yeah. et cetera. Sorry, Ted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will share my screen, which I think works because we can go back. Okay, we're all good? Yep. Great, so my name is um, Gigi Yu. I'm an assistant professor in the art education program in the art department. Um, today I'm gonna talk about early childhood communities and working with art materials and um, art, um, artistic thinking and processes. Uh, as we know, current neurological and educational research confirms there's a very long, um, long history, a long theory that the foundation for a lifetime of learning, growth, and development is established in the first five years of a child's life. Studies show that a high majority of young children spend a considerable portion of their day in various types of childcare and preschool settings, and that early childhood educators therefore play a very key role in providing experiences that support children's development. However, um, here in the Southwest, 
we consistently rank uh, at the bottom for child well-being and education. And oftentimes this is, the response to this is giving early childhood educators prepackaged curricula uh, that's very linear and limited in thinking. Um, and also classroom environments are made up of manufactured <clears throat> materials predominantly displaying primary colors such as red, yellow, and blue. The complexities of young children's brain development are often lacking in the design of early childhood settings, including teacher professional development. So I would also add to this that this is also reflected in early childhood um, teachers' low pay, low pay positions. They're often the lowest paid positions in, it, in the field of education. So today I'm going to talk about the Collaborative Educators Institute, which is a community of diverse early childhood educators organized by Christy Kalunga at Paradise Valley Community College in Phoenix, Arizona, with funding support from the First Things First Phoenix North Regional Council. Since 2016, I work with the CEI to design encounters with artistic thinking and practice artistic spaces as alternative pathways for reimagining early childhood teaching practices. So in this presentation, I'll share some of the data that's been collected through annual reports um, and, and the e evaluations, which um, consisted of two online survey surveys yearly and also a series of focus groups. And these contribute to the, the narrative that I'm gonna share with you. So the work of the CEI is grounded in socio-construction educational philosophies, primarily the Italian educator and children's activist, Loris Malaguzzi, who is known as the founder of the Reggio Emilia approach, named after the Italian city, which came into existence after World War II. Key concepts of the Reggio Emilia approach inspire the work of the CEI, including the role of the atelier, um, or otherwise known as the studio, where children, teachers, and artists research the world together with materials often referred to as the hundred languages. The CEI is inspired by the concept of, this, of the atelier as a way of seeing and being that disrupts uh, traditional ways of thinking about school. In this slide are the yearly topics that have been explored by the CEI. And through these overarching topics, art making and meeting is socially constructed through um, the hundred languages. And one CEI participant stated, another big thing about the studio concept that we've learned is the interconnectedness of every discipline. This image reflects the CEI framework. Um, and uh, so the CEI participants meet for in-person large group sessions four times a year. And they also meet in virtual small group sessions four times a year. Um, of course, during COVID, we were meeting online instead of for the in-person sessions. And we, uh, the participants also share their work virtually through a Google Classroom. In each in-person session, we study a particular art concept or form, sometimes through guest presenters or visiting places such as Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, studio or the Heard Museum to study Native American pottery. We also study children's, the children's works themselves and their words. Presentations are shared that include children's works and words as they encounter, invent, and create with the art materials. And the presentations allow participants to see the connection between children and artists' creative processes. Within the presentations, children are not seen as copying artists' works. Uh, instead, children are seen as artists as capa and capable creators of themselves who, who create in similar and, and diverse ways. Also during the CEI gatherings, we attempt to create an atelier studio atmosphere where the educators are given time and space for open-ended hands-on research with materials. The participants are introduced to the language of the material through hands-on provocations. Often participants engage with experiences that focus both on their individual um, artistic process as well as co collaborative and creative processes. An important aspect of the work of the CEI is reflective practice. CEI participants try out ideas um, within their own classrooms. They document the experiences through photography, video, um, writing, observational notes. And then um, this documentation is then shared through an online Google platform, um, but also through these during our in-person meetings, the teachers share their documentation. 
So in, in an essence, in this process, we are learning um, from the children as well. The reflections contribute to this on, to the ongoing research and narrative of each of the individual classrooms. So what we've noticed over time is this relationship with the materials and how it's been influencing the teachers and inter interpretations of their teaching practices. By investigating with materials is not just about how to incorporate them in the classroom, but also the teacher's development of their own artistic inquiries with the materials. For both children and teachers, art making is, is a dynamic interchange between the maker and the material where both are shaped in the process. And these are, are two quotes from uh, CEI participants um, during the year of clay and uh, just how much clay was influencing um, their, their work with children, but also their own thoughts about themselves as a teacher. So um, what we've also noticed over time is that participants expressed increased consciousness of the importance of quality materials and the difference it made in the creative processes and outcomes. They realize that the materials are multilingual, a vehicle for both verbal and nonverbal expression, for connecting with oneself and with others in a deepened relationship. So also what we're learning about working in this community of practice, as one participant said, the, um, as a result of attending multiple uh, CEI sessions, I observed from a different perspective. Before I was almost burnt out of teaching and through the CEI, I found others who affirmed me. So um, one of the things that I think we, we are thinking about and wondering is about is how this model of the CEI framework can influence other early childhood communities to create a more complex image of early childhood educators and also of children. Um, and in this slide is, is an example of, this, of the teachers exhibiting their own work, their own um, thinking process, their own artistic processes. And then this exhibit was shared with a broader education community. So that's it. Thank you, Gigi. Sorry for putting you on the spot there. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, once again, I think we have time for one question. Okay, I am gonna go ahead and share 10 slides. You all let me know if you can see them. Okay, I can see them. Adam, good. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and plow through then and just say next and you can go ahead and advance. Perfect. So, um, I'm Ted Hohola, Director of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. Next. So our mission is indicated there is really to educate and inform Indigenous design and planning by um, using culturally appropriate practices for community development. Next. And uh, today, I just want to share a little bit about the process that we've gone through in terms of developing a conceptual framework around place knowing. Next. Um, and we begin by essentially thinking about how to look at overall concepts, uh, and in particular, examining things like the worldview. Next. And as you can see, there are um, components that are really informed by um, how it is that um, indigenous people and particularly with their relationship to the land over a millennium have developed conceptual frameworks. One of course is the notion of boundary, next. Also orientations toward uh, the sacred landscape in terms of directionality and places, next. And uh, beginning to develop a social system by which then uh, it acknowledges the kind of uh, system that uh, is integrated into the environment and the ecology 
is represented by this winter and summer uh, society. Next. So the other thing that we also examine is the concept of seven generations. This is a schematic of Pueblo, Benito, and Chaco Canyon. Next. But the reason we use this is because uh, very few people understand and know that it took 140 years to complete. And um, we um, also know through archaeological evidence that there were seven phases. So we kind of do the math. That's about 20 years per phase equals one generation. But in terms of engaging with community, we also want them to understand that things sometimes that are done today may not be completed in their lifetime, but uh, how is it that that vision can be uh, forwarded to the next generation who's going to go and actually complete what it is that got started? Next. And was uh, indicated by the earlier presenter in the Grand Canyon a presentation actually that I really loved. Um, there is this notion of cycle, which is really integral to thinking about how we examine time and space. Next. Uh, next. And uh, I can't go into the specifics of this, but this was a conceptual model that we actually developed based on cyclical timelines and beginning to sort of get away from the Euro Westernization of linear approach and looking at it more from the standpoint of episodic periods of growth and development for, in this case, uh, the Anasazi community. Next. So how do we apply these in practice in terms of the projects that we do? Um, we worked on a project through Art Place America with Zuni Pueblo and also Main Street, New Mexico. Next. And we began to apply some of these kinds of principles. This particular petroglyph is at one of the sacred sites for Zuni Pueblo, and it depicts a migration spiral, and it also has those straight, those little sort of like little um, zigzags, but each one of those is kind of an important point of time, and we appropriated that as a way to begin to reconstruct the history of the community. Next. So you can see this in um, the historic time map that we did. So we start with emergence and uh, we identify those uh, moments in time that are important in terms of conversations around the growth and the change in the community. And you notice that it becomes jagged uh, beginning in 1539 when um, the first uh, expedition of Coronado came into um, the well, first contact was made by the uh, conquistas next. And we continue that in terms of providing finer, granular kinds of event staging as it moved into contemporary society. So all these points were conversations with the community about what was significant and important in terms of growth and change. Next. So we also examine uh, the assets of the community um, in terms of looking at how it is that they fit some of the criterion for the kind of economic programming required by Main Street. Next. And from this, then we begin to uh, develop a way in order to frame um, how it is that we could identify different uh, traditional areas as well as more contemporized areas. The challenge being that a state highway runs through it and how do they then begin to protect and guide uh, people going through their community as well as uh, protect those that are living there. Next. So the bigger conversation that uh, emerged out of this is what is Zuni art? Next. And uh, found out that uh, indeed um, many uh, people from all over the world come to Zuni. This is in their tourism department. It shows the little points that people put in there from where they were at. Next. So the conversation shifted with regards to then how do people wayfind and orient um, themselves within this kind of context. Uh, so we did a design build studio as part of our engagement 
in order to start working with Zuni artists to see how we could expand that experience and make it more meaningful for the visitors that uh, came to the village next. And this included uh, wayfinding stones, which are those colorful stones right there, but also signage that was designed to each participant artist to indicate both the style and uh, the place where um, they had their studios next. And then these were um, manufactured and actually um, put in place of all of the artists that were participating in uh, the project that we were beginning to uh, develop next. And that project was called the Zuni Art Walk. Unfortunately, it's been uh, suspended as a result of COVID, but um, it went from a program that was intended to be uh, three or four times a year to one that was done every month before it got shut down. But the idea was to be able to bring uh, visitors into the Zuni homes and have them host in terms of how it is that they they uh, did their uh, art, but also um, learning more about Zuni culture itself. Next. So if you get a chance, um, there's a, a public tour that occurs. Um, these transport visitors actually go through um, a particular route at 20 minute intervals. Next. And you can see the particular stops here. Originally started with nine artists. By the time they got shut down, there were 23 artists with intention for much more in terms of their expansion. Next. And when you got to the destination, you could wait for the next truck or you could spend, um, or bus, and you could spend as much time as possible. But here's um, one of the artists who's a potter, traditional potter, explaining the whole sort of process and uh, ability not only for people to learn about that process, but be able to purchase or uh, continue their uh, relationship with them in, in the future. Next. So um, from this, um, you know, we learned that placemaking and uh, is really important in terms of thinking about how it is that we bring out the voices of people in the communities. And one of our mantras is that the people are beautiful already. So this whole process is really intended to empower them in a way then that they can use that voice as an expression directly to those people that they want to engage and who are interested in being able to deal with um, how they build their own sense of community and, and um, how it is that you know we can bring that kind of um, artistic merit, but also use it as a way of building economic diversity within the communities in a way that's much more constructive and meaningful uh, and impactful on the overall landscape. So I think I'll stop it right at there because uh, I think we're running out of the time, but that's what I wanted to share with everybody. <laughs>